Hi there, it's Willem. Welcome to a new episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. So uh, this time and every time I'm editing uh, an episode, I'm, I'm conscious of what I'm saying and listening back at it. Even just this intro right now, I thought I'd recorded just a good take and for some reason uh, my, my recording thing didn't work and I just like missed half of it so I have to record it again. But I'm conscious of, you know, how it sounds and what do I, what do I want to improve and of course, I think that sounds pretty normal. So I've been listening to a lot more interview-based, uh, some of the popular podcasts like uh, WTF with Mark Maron, the Tim Ferriss podcast, How to Be Amazing with Michael Ian Black, uh, the Brett Easton Ellis podcast. All of those are brilliant. Uh, if ever you don't know them, check them out. Uh, I've been listening to you know conversations like on The Nerdist and, and many others. And, uh, and I've noticed everybody's got different kinds of intros. So... I'm kind of starting to work out how mine should be. And it's it's funny because I think essentially I'm just trying to be myself and be natural. But as soon as I'm looking at how or listening to the way that I'm speaking and what I'm saying and what is natural for me to say or not, then myself is, seems to be pretty elusive as soon as I start looking at it and then I start overthinking it. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that way. I know for now at least that uh, I want to keep the intro relatively short and sweet. Give more time to the guest, essentially, which I think is probably why you're listening. It's the reason why I'm interested in talking to them in the first place. I want to hear from them. So uh, there's one thing I'll still do that before going on to the guest is I will remind you that don't forget you can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, as well as my web, my main website, icecreamforeveryone.net. That's everything spelled out, icecreamforeveryone.net. And I'm also mentioning this because if ever you're listening to iTunes or Stitcher, it will be awesome if you can click that subscribe button if you enjoyed the show. And if you enjoy the show, then please, please spread the news. Just tell a friend about it, essentially. I mean, add it on Twitter or on Facebook or just if you know at least one person you think will enjoy the contents of one episode, just send it over to them, essentially. Moving on to today's guest. Today's guest is Heather Lefevre, a marketing and brand strategist like I am. Uh, she has a lot of experience working with brands all over the world for renowned creative agencies on many projects you might have heard of, uh, particularly if you work in advertising. But even if you don't, actually, there's some of the ads you, you probably come across. And she's worked with uh, pretty renowned agencies like Crispin Porter and Bogusky, Tribal DDB, Strawberry Frog. Now she's been freelancing uh, and she also teaches master classes with Hyper Island. She started this thing called the Strategist Survey that used to be called the Planner Survey a community-based initiative with a, a survey that goes out to all the people working in planning and strategy all around the world and find out what they're up to. And she recently published a book called Brain Surfing that we talk about during the episode. It's a really brilliant book. I highly recommend it. For anybody interested in learning about business, brands, creative communications, uh, I gave it as a gift to my father for Christmas, and he really enjoyed it as well. So it's definitely not only for strategy geeks, uh, anybody interested in business and creative communications can enjoy this and will enjoy it, I think. So we talk about all this and more during the episode. So enjoy. Hello, Heather. Welcome to the show. Hi, Willem. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you very much. Uh, I just said it, but I'm in Vienna at the moment. I believe you're in Miami, right? Correct. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Well, thank you very much for taking time to join me for this. I really appreciate it. It's great to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so I usually start with a, a warm-up question, uh, and I'm going to ask you about, I saw that a few months ago you published a video, uh, and I watched it again this morning, actually, of stand-up comedy. Yes. Uh, the, so that was the conclusion of a five-week course, I believe. So I thought I'd ask you, well, number one, is that something that you wanted to do for a long time, improv, or how did it come about? I guess it came about, I took an improv class here. Yeah. And it was just in the uh, in the service of becoming a better presenter. Mm -hmm. But I found that improv, this is, I'm not trying to be egotistical, but, you know, improv is very much influenced by how much the other people participate. So if the person that's in your scene with you doesn't give you anything, it's very frustrating. Yeah. So I felt that with stand-up comedy, you you fly or you fail on your own effort. Mm. So I wanted to try that and not, you know, not have to feel like it was dependent upon other people. Right. 
So I tried that and now I really like it. I'm going to, I, you know, when I was finishing the book, I didn't have as much time for it, but I'm going to start trying again. And, uh, Miami is actually a really good place for stand up to, for beginners because you can fall flat on your face and no one will really see <laughs> like any, you know, anybody like an agent or something. So, uh -huh. and you can pretty easily get five minutes on stage here a few nights a week, even as a beginner. Cool. And that you just need a lot of stage time to build up your material. That was five minute your, your routine. And I noticed there was a, there was, a, it was quite heavily pretty sexual and even edgy <laughs> on that side of things. Is that yeah. the kind of humor you like or is it sex sells or? I think it's the kind of humor I like, but also it's just what, you know, what the first rule of comedy is to use your own life. Mm. So, I mean, for the audience, my husband is 13 years younger than me. And that's, that is unique. That is not typical. So, um, and also I'm really tall. So those were the two areas that I discussed, yeah. in, you know, in my act. And it just sort of worked out that way that the being, being tall and having a younger husband are, <laughs> so have, have, have sexual aspects about them. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, so we're going to talk through the interview about your book. I have your book here. Oh, yay. Cool. Uh, and so we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit more and we'll weave in talking about it throughout the interview. It's a, the book is called Brain Surfing, subtitled The Top Marketing Strategy Minds of the World, right? Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Uh, to start with the interview, I, I, so before we get to the book, because that's kind of the culmination and what's going on right now, I thought it'd be cool to, to talk a little bit about how you got here. And, uh, you studied in, and you were born in Texas, right? That's correct. Yeah. And you studied advertising. I did. I did an undergrad in English and then I did a grad degree in advertising. So how did you, did you, so you already knew you wanted to get into advertising. How did that happen? So as I was finishing my English degree early, all of my friends were still in school and I had a roommate who was studying advertising. So I happened to take a class with her as an elective and I found that I liked it. And, and at the time, if you had an English degree in the U.S., you were pretty much predestined to become a teacher or a pharmaceutical sales rep. And neither of those options seemed interesting. So I pursued more school. Okay. And I, th I mean, at the time when I started, I thought I was going to be a copywriter having the English background and the writing background. Um, but then I learned about strategy in school. We had a track for account planning uh -huh. and it felt like the right thing for me. So, so that's interesting. You, you were in planning from the beginning of your career then pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just, just to make sure, and for the people who are not necessarily into advertising, uh, who are, who are going to be listening to this, how do you, how do you explain what you do and, and how does the process, how does it fit within the, the process of advertising? Okay. So the way that I design, d define it is that we're creating competitive advantage for brands. Okay. And that, that's the shortest, you know, punchiest phrase that I can get it down to. And so if you unpack that, mm -hmm. I think that you can see, you know, you can see things that are not brands that have, you know, no competitive advantage. Like it, look at how weed is becoming legal in the U.S., yes. you know, and it's going from something that was, you know, sold in a plastic baggie to beginning to have a brand. Yeah. And you see how that that industry is is growing and changing. So something that that nascent, I think that's when you can really start to see how something like design can impact your appeal toward the product. Mm. So the things that we do, I think, fall into sort of four buckets that we, we do research mm -hmm. to understand what is, you know, who are the people who might buy this thing? What's going on in society right now um, that might be impactful? Mm. What's the history of this company that you might draw on um, the, anything from the way that the thing is made to the way that the people who sell it are trained, you know, there's, there might be something if you're, you know, you, I use the word research, but it's really like investigation, you mm -hmm. know, find everything that could possibly be useful. And then that next stage is to diagnose mm -hmm. what, what is it that you could use? You could leverage moving forward that would be useful. And that takes, you know, some creativity to take, take away what's, not important and to only focus on what you think is important. Mm. Then there's like a design phase, like coming up with things 
And those things could be typically advertising. And that's how it's been for probably the first two thirds of my career. Mm -hmm. But then I know you know this, but you know, now there's so many things you could do. You can change the way that the store looks. You can actually, you know, fix things about the product that makes it more appealing and have more competitive advantage. And then the last side I would say is, is a persuading element. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to convince the companies that spending any money to try to grow their business and to put an idea in a person's mind is worth doing. Hmm. So, cool. Uh, the, um, does I that jive just, with how you see it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it, it, I, I agree. Um, and uh, yeah, it definitely jives. Uh, it's not a word I usually use. It's quite interesting. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you, I was reviewing a couple of your videos this morning. Okay. And um, you, you gave a video as uh, you were reviewing some uh, some graduate documents from uh, students at the University of Texas of the same cursed curriculum that you did, as I understand it. Right. And uh, and you worked for an agency called Crispin Porter and Bogusky at, at the moment where they did a bunch of campaigns working on Burger King that came to be quite famous in the advertising industry. Um, uh, the Whopper Sacrifice and Whopper Freakout and Whopper Virgins. You worked on all of those, right? That's correct. Yeah. So I thought, could you choose like maybe one of them and explain a little bit how it works, how the behind the scenes works for, for people who don't work in advertising, explaining a little bit what your role was and how they came about, if you can, of sure. course. Of course. I think the Whopper Virgins one is the, the clearest story because, I mean, you can work on something and then it never see the light of day. Mm. But in that case, you know, we got to, to sort of do the full spectrum. So a year prior... We'd done a campaign called Whopper Freakout, which was very famous and it won a lot of awards where they took the Whopper off the menu and sort of punked the customers. And the, the success of that campaign was partially due to getting the client to even be willing to advertise a plain Whopper. Mm -hmm. They sort of had this belief that you needed to only advertise a limited time offer, like a, the Angry Whopper, the Texas Whopper, you know? Yeah. Um, so just getting their minds open that the plain Whopper is worthy of being talked about was a win. Mm. And then they wanted to do it again because it was so successful. So then it's like, how do you have a, you know, have a wonderful, amazing number one hit and then try and do it again a year later? So I happened to be teaching a class at the Miami Ad School. Um, and the students had, you know, they were in their first week of, of the account planning boot camp. Mm -hmm. And we we talked about like some of the basic research that you can go out to do to investigate and, you know, sort of size up a problem. And we talked about doing man on the street interviews. Mm -hmm. um, so they went out and started talking to people about Whoppers and they came back. And, you know, I had been working on this for a, over a year and sort of had been brainwashed that the Whopper is America's best loved burger because that's how it technically performs in research. Okay. But one of the things that they came back with that was surprising to me, and I think that's really important is to find something that's surprising either to you or that will be surprising to your client. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's also similar to stand up is that it's that shift in the mind of surprise. And so what was surprising was that they were going up to people who said, Oh, I've never eaten a Whopper. And at, while at the same time, there is research done when you, you, you present, these are the top selling fast food burgers, like the Big Mac at McDonald's and the Whopper from Burger King mm -hmm. and Burger King performs the best or it did at the time. And so, so to see those two conflicting pieces of information, you know, created a spark. Yeah. And so the, the question was, is, is like, who are all these people who have never eaten this very popular American sandwich? And so that is something that went into the brief that, you know, we've got Whopper virgins out there and there's quite, there's a, many millions of them just in America. What should we do with them? Mm. And so the creatives then saw something else in it of, okay, well, sure, there's Whopper virgins in America, but there's Whopper virgins all over the world. What about these people that live in really remote locations that they don't have any access to fast food or they perhaps have never even seen a burger before? And that's what they dramatized. Yeah, I, and I, I remember the video and, and I saw them and it was, I really liked the uh, the dramatization exactly of like starting to show that as a 
high definition, high production value kind of documentary, and then and then it's it's for fast food in the end, and seeing the reactions of, of people's faces, it, it was a lot of fun, and it was quite memorable. Oh yeah, like when the guy lifts up the burger, like he's never he doesn't even know how to handle it. Yes, exactly. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember as you're saying it. Actually, I haven't seen yeah. the piece in a, in a quite a few years, but it, it's something that I definitely remember, and I'll I'll put in the show notes for the people who haven't seen it. The video is probably okay. still available online, right? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. What did I want to ask? Oh, uh, one thing about stand-up comedy. You are, I'm, I'm, I've started, do you like um, Aaron Sorkin? I started watching Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip again. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it. I should watch it? Yes, definitely, definitely. Okay. Did, you, did you ever watch The West Wing? I did, yeah. Enjoyed that? I did, yeah. Yeah, you should definitely check out Studio 60. It's the I'm show he did time. straight after that unfortunately got killed after one season. Ah. Uh, but, but it is still very, very good. And it's very unfortunate that it didn't find an audience at the time. It's the behind the scenes of a, of a Friday night com- live comedy show. Okay. I yeah. will check it out. So let's see what else. And then you, you, there's a moment you moved to, down to Amsterdam, right? That's right. Yeah. How did you, how did that come about? Or like wanting to move across the pond and opportunity arise? Um, a number of factors. So I got married at 22 because I'm from Texas and that's what you do when you're from Texas. Mm. And I got divorced at 28 because that's also, I think what happens a lot of times when you get married at 22. Mm. So part of, you know, my twenties, I sort of realized that I wanted to live outside of the U S mm. and that was a important aspect or goal for me. And then on the other side, we haven't started talking about it, but the strategy survey, the planner survey, yeah. Um, it introduced me to a lot of different people and, um, it was actually because of, there was an intern at Crispin at the time and he had gone to the University of Texas. We became friends and they offered him a job as a art director and then didn't take care of his visa application in time. And so he had to leave the country and he was Egyptian. Um, and he didn't want to go back to, um, Cairo. Mm. So we just sent his resume to every single contact I had at the time. This was 2008 um, in an English speaking country. So Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Singapore, any place that he could possibly work. And the one person that responded was in Amsterdam. And so he ended up getting a job at AKQA and that guy who responded was a freelancer. And, and then he went, moved on to tribal DDB at, you know, in those months that, Amr was getting a job. And so he sort of said, so what about you, Heather? Would you ever come over here? And it just didn't occur to me. It didn't occur to me that an American can work outside of the U.S. Uh-huh. I really thought I had to do the Foreign Service or the Peace Corps or just save up money and travel. Those mm. were sort of the only ways that I thought I could get out of the country. And so that was what I was weighing on one hand versus the other, you know, just go and tool around or continue to do something that I love. Mm. And, um, and Europe is so expensive. Like you can't just backpack around Europe for very long. Yeah. Uh, but this way I lived there for five years. Fantastic. That's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, so you just mentioned the strategist, well, firstly planner and newly uh, renamed strategist survey. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how that started? Sure. Um, so when I was, uh, about five years into the business, it was time for my performance evaluation Mm -hmm. and I wanted to know, am I being paid fairly as a female? Should I be asking for a raise? And you read all these things that, uh, you know, in negotiation, it's much better to have an objective source of information. Like people with this many years of experience typically, typically get paid this much as opposed to, um, I want to buy more pizzas and dresses. So give me more money, you know? Yeah. And so I started the survey and I just sent it out to, I think only about 30 people that I knew that had that kind of job. And I said, you know, it was anonymous. And I said, if you fill it out, I'll share the results with everybody. And the first year, I think about 130 people took it and Mm. it just grew and grew and grew. And so now we're in the ninth year of doing it. And, uh, we've already have 2,203 completes for this year. I think for this year. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and I was, think there's about 10,000 planner strategists in the world. That's who, my guess. Would that be who people that generally work in what the creative industries you would call like as a yeah. general pop, like across media, advertising, marketing, branding? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that I would count like a marketing manager in that 
okay. quite in that amount, but somebody that's doing that process of sort of research, diagnose, design, persuade kind of job. Got it. I, and this is, I mean, it's a project I love, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the team. I help you look at the yeah. data for this. Um, exactly. Part of the we reasons, can never, ever do it without all of the people that kindly give their time for free. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And yes, it, it's, well, it's part of the reason, I mean, it's, it's something that did help me in the, in the beginning of my career as a planner. How? And uh, well, negotiate and look at my salary at one okay. point. That's definitely been helpful. And also... Uh, talking to other planners and learning from other planners is what allowed me to get into planning in the first place. So meeting and talking with other fellow planners, number one, is always enriching because I always find the yes. really interesting people to talk to. Yeah. Uh, and and number two, which is part of the reason why I'm, I'm doing this now, is giving me just an extra excuse to, to give time to, to take time from people while well, off of their normal schedule and have a conversation that's going to be interesting to other people. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so so that's just I, I thought it was a fantastic, and I th think it still is a fantastic initiative to help people keep in touch, and and the fact that it's community initiated, like you know, for the group of people by the group of people, if that makes sense, yeah, uh, is is something that's really brilliant and very rich, and I really love participating in it. Yeah, me too. I wouldn't do it if you guys didn't help. It's too much work. <laughs> <laughs> it's, by now, it's grown to be a lot of work. Yeah, I'm sure. I yeah. mean, it's 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 a big thing. Um, cool. So uh, how did you find the differences between working in America as a planner and strategist and working in Europe in Amsterdam? So they are numerous. Um, let's see some of them we can share. Uh, I think it's just for me, it was novel. So when you're working in the U.S., a, a trip will come up and it's like, Heather, we need you to go to Milwaukee on Tuesday. And over there, it's like, Heather, we need you to go to Milan on Tuesday. <laughs> like, I'd much rather go to Milan. Um, and then also the people that you work with, uh, at least in Amsterdam, it's kind of like a semester at sea kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I was working with, I think we had maybe at one point 50 people in our office and maybe 30 different nationalities. Mm -hmm. So it's just extremely diverse and you, you just pick up and learn, you're going on business trips with an Australian and an Irish person and uh, an English person, and you just learn their backgrounds and how they were raised differently and um, how, how where they're from is just different. So they're, you're constantly sharing and learning and being exposed outside of your work. Mm. And then as far as how the work is different, um, working across multiple countries is different from one large basically monoculture where at least it's one language. Um, I mean, there's, there's certainly multicultural advertising that happens in the U S mm -hmm. but, but by and large, there are big general market campaigns. So, so it's just different. You've got a big group of Americans working on American brands for America, yeah. which is different than a big diverse group of people working on a big global brand for the whole world. Mm -hmm. And I notice in my experience sometimes of working with brands on international versus local levels, it tends to be shifts around. Sometimes brands are trying to find an idea and a theme that's going to work across the world. Yeah. And sometimes they go back towards like actually localizing towards languages and cultures. Do you, do you have an opinion about like whether there's one that's better than the other or? I think the answer is for everything is it depends. And that's why we're, we're useful is to make that call. Is this a brand like Coca-Cola that is very similar across the world? And maybe there are, um, interpretations and nuances that can be localized, but it's, it makes sense to have one big global theme. Mm -hmm. Or is it a, or is it a company or a brand or a category that people interact with in very, very different ways? Like, um, the way that you raise your child can have it can be very very different so like i worked on pampers mm -hmm. um when i was in amsterdam and part of part of our our remit was um amia so in the in the middle east and africa you can have mothers going to a corner store and buying one diaper at a time yeah so they might use a cloth diaper most of the time and then when they're going they're traveling or they're visiting family or they're having people over that's when they choose to use a diaper mm. that's really different from a german mom who has the the resources to buy a big pack of diapers at a big box store yeah absolutely. <laughs> you know 
So there's some things about the love that a mother has for a child that that crosses socioeconomic and geographic differences. But then there are some things that that are very, very different in terms of purchase behavior that you have to take into consideration. Mm. Cool. Um, so th- we've mentioned travel a little bit. So you'd already traveled from the States over to Amsterdam. And then when you left the last job that you had in Amsterdam, that's when you started working on the on the book project, right? Right. That's right. Yep. Uh, yes. Do you think, so, so, well, can, can you tell us a little bit about the project and how it started? Okay. So, so uh, all of these things are like mashups of, of little threads that, are, you know, happen in your life. So mm. the survey was part of it. So a lot of people send me messages either asking for career advice or just asking my opinion about the strategy business. And one of the questions that came up frequently is, is similar. You, you just asked it, like, how is, planning strategy different in one country versus another. Yeah. A lot of people are very curious about that. Yeah. And and so I was wondering is there a way to answer that how is it different mm-hmm. in a in a way that's compelling or interesting and and I thought about that in terms of could we change the survey to answer that. And I just don't think that you can. I don't think that somebody self-reporting um without having seen both, you know, having seen their culture and their country and how they work compared to another one can really give you the answer. Mm. And then I started thinking, okay, well, there's no way that anybody could ever, you know, go in and interview all of them and get any kind of feeling for how it's different because two places across the street from each other in Amsterdam can be really different or in Cape Town, uh, between Amsterdam and Cape Town. So it just became like, okay, there's no way to answer this question realistically. And then I read Eat, Pray, Love, and it was really an impactful book for me. I got a divorce, and I'm a white American woman who had, you know, desires to travel. And it just sort of hit me that, okay, well, maybe I can't learn everything, but what it, what could I learn by going around and meeting different people? Mm. And then there was also just a vulnerability and a sense that over my career, at least, Things have changed a lot, you know, like I got my first email address in 1995 and things just went from there. You know, people were making websites that were brochures and then they were making things on the web that were useful to people. And to just stay on top of those different things, I mean, that is very challenging. So I felt mm. insecure. Um, so that's what I wanted to do is to shore up my experience. And I just thought, there's no way that going back to school will be as useful to me as being on the front lines. Yeah. So I just thought, okay, this is a crazy idea. Will anyone say yes to it? I'll just put it out there. And people said yes. Fantastic. So, I mean, the, I guess I haven't exactly said what I did, but I went and I worked with different people for two weeks each. And the twist is, is that I stayed with them in their homes because that way I had commuting time and, you know, sort of their downtime on the weekend to really get to know them, their family, and to ask all the questions that could come to mind. Because if you sit down with somebody for an interview for an hour, two hours, you get something out of it for sure. Mm. But it's not the same as, you know, really digging into somebody's experience and making them dig deep <laughs> and tell you what they know. Yeah, really getting to see them in their natural habitat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just backtracking one one point because you you said you studied English and it was interesting. I was at a conference last week and uh, and then somebody published an article about the, the, one of her observations from the conference was that uh, all planners and strategists seem to be writers. W- did you have an aspiration to write and did you write already when you were younger? Uh, I would say somewhat. So I like the idea of having written a book, mm. but I don't like the idea of all my work being by myself. Okay. So, so I'm not, um, a person who just wants to be holed up in a cave (laughs) and like, don't talk to me kind of person. I really enjoy interacting with people. Mm. So I always, the same roommate that was majoring in advertising, she and I basically swapped lives. So she did an undergrad in advertising and then went on to do a master's in creative writing and Mm -hmm. has written fiction. Okay. And then I, you know, was doing the English and went on to do. Um, advertising, but I studied rhetoric, which is the study of persuasive language and persuasive writing. Um, and so I see that as being very, 
um, you know, parallel to the marketing world yeah. because we're, we're either persuading people to buy or we're persuading, um, you know, people to buy our ideas in a B2B sense. Mm-hmm. So I think I see them as very similar. Wow. Brilliant. Thank you. And the, um, and the traveling side of things was that, so you mentioned you, you, I mean, you always wanted to travel. Yes. Do you think that's part of, does that make you a better strategist? And do you think traveling does make better planners and strategists generally? I think it makes us better humans. So I can't say that it's just going to make you a better strategist. Um, the planet is so varied and spectacular and anybody who doesn't want to see it, I just, I can't understand. Well, yeah. I mean, I yeah. tend to agree and I love traveling and it is one of the yeah. things I talk about in the, the podcast and, and one of the traits that I like look at choosing people to talk with, uh, in the podcast and generally as well. I mean, uh, it, it's always enriching to talk about different places. Yeah. I think what's maybe more interesting are the yeah. people who make some sort of sacrifice to travel, you know, that uh-huh. it just get handed in their lap. Cause that's what I like about you is that you wanted to travel so much that you designed your lifestyle, your work life to make that happen. And so that's, that's something that I did too. And, and so those I think are the people that are more interesting who've made some sort of like, uh, do you know Heidi Hackmer? She's, I don't know her, but I, I definitely would like to get in touch. I know of her. And yeah, of you her should interview and, her. Yes, she's exactly. fantastic. And yeah. so she's traveled all over the U S and which I think is super, super interesting is that that it's so varied here. Yeah. And so I sort of asked her, like, did she have any interest in living abroad? And, and her perspective is, is that there's so much variety and intrigue just within the borders of the U S that she, she doesn't get tired of it. So, I mean, she, she, um, did sort of what you did, like chose to freelance in order to travel. Mm. And so she would, um, instead of scuba diving, she would camp <laughs> and, you yeah. know, get out of nature as well. Um, so I, those kinds of people, people like you and Heidi that make an effort to travel, that sacrifice something to travel, that's when I think you really start to get, um, a level of, of appreciation for different cultures and somebody who's, who's sucking it in mm. and going to make something out of it, making the friends and the contacts that might prove useful later, later, as opposed to, I've been to resorts in 30 countries. Yeah. And is it something you recommend to people? Uh, I don't think you have to recommend tr- it to people. So one of the lines in my book is who doesn't like to travel? The people, those people probably marry the people who don't like music, you know? Okay, that's true. Yeah. You do I say don't that. think that there's anybody who doesn't, who fundamentally hates travel to the core. So I don't think you have to recommend it. I, but, you, but there's a difference between just taking a yeah. holiday and like, and taking, you know, stopping things in a certain way that's, thought through and you mentioned this in your book so such as the the talk of the quite famous designer Stefan Sagmeister mm-hmm. who has started designing his life to take sabbaticals every seven years yeah that are travels but it's purposeful it's really going and researching experimenting something different in that sense or letting your curiosities drive you okay and because he's gone you know he's spent he spends a whole year which I think is fascinating so he'll go to different places and rent a house in that country and and become part of that community and see what it's like mm-hmm. uh, in addition to having like art projects and things that he wants to try out yeah um so yeah like people like that that kind of bucket i guess i would recommend it to people i haven't been asked <laughs> <laughs> to get i don't give unsolicited advice i guess <laughs> sure. okay. uh, i i was just as i said earlier reviewing some of the videos and you published like short interviews video interviews with some of the mentors that you lived and and uh worked with Yes. And notice that you, the order of the book is not necessarily the chronolog- chronological order in which you went to visit them. The only one that's different is bra- chapter eight and chapter nine. Okay. As so there's actually not that much difference. It shouldn't be. It might be when I published the video, but the, otherwise it is chronological. Okay. Okay. So, because I, I was just suddenly wondering if you reordered them in order to make a, a, a certain flow of, to the story of what you learned in the end. A little bit. I did change that at the end because I think that there is sort of a trajectory from working in an agency to toward some of the digital things. So I wanted it to have a bit of a tra- trajectory, but I think that there was also um, a bit of a journey in terms of when I started, I really thought I'd end up in Asia. Mm. That was That was what I was, I think, sort of hoping for, but it was very different than what I expected. 
for example, the pollution in China was very bad yeah. to, to the extent that I don't think I can live there. Yeah. Um, I think I could live in Hong Kong or Singapore, but then they're also much smaller m- markets in terms of the number of ad agencies and then just the sheer number of headcount. There's just not that many jobs. There's tons of jobs for humans. There's just not that many jobs for um, strategists. And then on top of that, I think that maybe the window of opportunity for expats, like they used to get sweet, you know, deals like what I got to move to Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a little bit challenging to, to move to that far and not have any help. So, I mean, that's basically what you did. You put all your stuff in storage and just went, right? Yeah, I just left. I mean, it, 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 it was nice of you to say that, you know, designing my life around travel, except that it's partly true. I did after wanting, I mean, the first thing was leaving. I was like, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm stopping this. I'm going off to travel. And then after traveling a few months, I was like, well, wait a second. I think people work and travel. Maybe I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why not me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so the designing happened midway and then, uh, and then living, moving to Singapore, I was close by. So that, that made the choice easier. I'd already, I already had everything in storage, but it's true. It was a local contract. Okay. Yeah. So, so while, you know, you're paid at expat level compared to locals, it's not like this kind of sweet deals that you mentioned where you get everything paid for and, and yeah. to move. Yeah. Yeah. So it just made it less appealing. And I mean, over the past 10 years, you know, I haven't had to um, make any effort to find my next job. Somebody came wanting me. Mm. Um, and so no, no opportunities just immediately laid themselves in front of my feet. And I didn't love the um, environment so much that I would do whatever it took mm. to be there. So, so that was a surprise that I didn't end up in Asia. So, but I think the surprise was it that you thought you would finish with the last trips or find a job in Asia and work over there? Uh, I mean, I, th- I think that I would end up finding a job and right. work there. That's what I sort of thought. And so that's why I think it made sense to start in Asia. It was the most different to my previous experience. Yes. And then to sort of progress from there and see how the rest of the world um, is, you know, tackling social, digital um, consultancies. What happens if you leave and start your own business? What happens if you are doing, you know, like hackathons like Saher is doing? Yeah. You know, he he tried that within the constraints of an agency and tried to help them be more innovative. And then he ultimately struck out on his own and mm-hmm. has his own company now. Um, and then similarly, since worldwide where I ended, you know, innovation, I think, is that next stretch into planners, strategists, whatever you want to call them in an agency, learn a very broad set of skills, but they're not necessarily all valued. Mm. You know, you, you might present a lot of different ideas to a client and then they say, silly ad agency, we just want the TV spot, mm. you know? So you have the capability, the thought process, the, the rigorous research that went into figuring out what would be good for a brand to do, mm-hmm. but then you're sort of boxed in and caged in. And I think that these innovation consultancies are sort of taking some of that off, some of those constraints off and being a little bit more, um, you know, letting you spread your wings in terms of your skill set. Mm. So that's why I sort of saw that as a bit of a progression. Mm. Got it. And uh, how did you, so, so you traveled, so you traveled to nine different locations uh, and by the way, we met, we met actually in person once and, uh, it was yes. in London. Uh, yeah. was it, I think it was part of your trips while you were doing your research, wasn't it? Or? I think so. I can't 100% remember because I was also freelancing there. So it's. Yeah. So hard. it was around that time. So it might yeah. have been. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, how did you take notes for the book during your, cause that's something that it, it's quite becoming interesting to me and I've been, listening to a couple of other podcasters podcasters uh, and podcast interviews talk about how people take notes, in particular Maria Popova of, of Brain Pickings and I listen to the Tim Ferriss podcast. And and, uh, and as I'm writing more myself, I'm like looking at how people take notes for their projects. Yeah, it's so true. I think I had no strategy when I began. I, I recorded conversations on my phone mm. and I jotted down a lot of notes. But um, I also read... A lot. I used that year and then the, the, con- the consecutive two years that it took me to write the book to read almost every business book, marketing book, sociology, psychology book that anybody had ever said would be beneficial to, um, to your career. 
And so I would take threads of that and the things that people said and that, and it sort of became like a patchwork quilt, the book, mm. you know? Um, but as I went along back to your point about the note taking, um, have you read Steven Johnson's where good ideas come from? Nope. That one's really, really good. So he talks about a practice from, I'm going to get this totally wrong, but I want to say, you know, the 1800s of a commonplace book. So when, when a learned person would read anything, they would take all their notes into one book. Mm. And so that's something that I've started doing is whenever I read a book or I listen to an audio book and I, I make bookmarks as I'm listening to the book and I will, every time I finish an audio book, I sit down for the, you know, 15 to 45 minutes that it takes to write down every single quote that I bookmarked in the audiobook, or if I've underlined things in a physical book, I copy them all out Mm. into my commonplace book. So I have these little notebooks full of things. And so then I go back to them because it's just like the highlights of these books and articles and conversations. And then you start to see the connections. Got it. And uh, Stefan Sagmeister also says, and a couple, I think it comes from somewhere else, that that uh, holding a journal is 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 good for the creative process, uh, that like a daily journal of thoughts. Is that something oh, that yeah. you do as well? I don't do that. Okay. I do not do that. Uh, cool. I mean, I do write frequently because I'm really trying to do the stand-up thing. Uh-huh. So you do have to sit down and do writing exercises. But I wouldn't say I'm doing like the creative, what is that book, The Artist's Way, Morning Pages. Have you heard of that? I've heard of it. Yeah. So that, that book, um, I took a class at one point where, uh, we did that religiously. So you're supposed to write three pages every day, non, and you write until they're full and sort of not lift the pen from the paper kind of thing and just see what comes out. So yeah. I've done that at points in my life, but I didn't do that for the book per se. Okay. And I don't do it now. It's, it's brilliant to hear you say you, you've uh, read so many books. And there's a lot of books referenced in, in your book, I, which I've really enjoyed reading. It was, it was just a, it's a really pleasurable read. And some of my favorite topics, as I've, I've, I've mentioned before uh, in a blog post about it, like, and even as we're talking about now. So talking about business, innovation, strategy, as well as traveling and meeting new people, new cultures, having new fun experiences and, some kind of quirky ones, like you going to the the the, the marriage wedding market in uh, yeah. in Shanghai. Shanghai, uh huh. Can you tell us a little bit about that, just to, as an anecdote, or any other sure. anecdote that you want to mention? For, sure. As for the um, well, I just very fortuitously met this gal named Erica Brenner, who um, she's a Brazilian girl who moved to China and completely learned Mandarin in about I think she took four years, but she is fluent. Wow. This girl is fluent. And so we're both six foot tall women. Like mm-hmm. she's, she's like part Austrian, part Brazilian. And so she told me about this marriage market when I first met her. We came across each other because she's also a strategist. And she, this marriage market exists in this, it's called the People's Park in Shanghai. And parents come every weekend and they make little ads like a, an A, is it A4, eight and a half by 11 paper mm-hmm. where they just explain the qualities of their child and they just lay it out on the ground underneath. They might stick it on an umbrella and then they go around meeting other parents and they're all holding photo albums of their child and they're trying to find matches. And it's very, a lot of it is based on um, income. What kind of job does this person have? (laughs) Are they a good match from a, from a mergers and acquisitions kind of standpoint? Mm -hmm. And I just thought it would be fun as long as they didn't feel that we were mocking them, which was not really the intention. It was just to try to be a part of it. So Erica wrote an ad about me Mm because I was single at the time. And we went to the park and put the ad on the ground and just started, people started coming up and asking us about it. And so she was sort of my surrogate mom speaking with everybody because she, she speaks the language. And luckily they thought it was fun and um, they were not offended by it. I mean, we were ready to, if, if people turned their nose up at us, we were just ready to leave. But, yeah. um, we were there for a couple of hours having conversations with people because I'm really tall. And one of the things you put on there is like looking for somebody who's at least as tall as me. Yeah. And that's just not very common in China. So that was funny. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the parents would show us pictures, but, you know, hardly anybody speaks English. So that would have been a very challenging. Um, match so yeah but it is it is brilliant and much fun that you've uh, done these kinds of experiences and i saw that you did manage to find one person who spoke english and 
told yes. you a little bit about how things worked over there, so you got a bit of perspective from that? Exactly, yeah. So there's this guy, Dr. Zhang, who is a professor in the U.S., so he was bilingual, and so he, I could talk to him. <laughs> yes. So he, he was there actually looking for somebody for his son who lived in California and um, just wanted that cultural connection uh, to, to try to potentially bring a, a girl for his son who was Chinese. So that's why he was there. Yeah. And it's just it's a normal thing that that happens there. Good. Yeah. And uh, you were in Shanghai and that was the moment you were staying with one of your mentors called Rob Campbell. Right. And uh, you published an interview with him and he talks about empathy as being a, an important part of our job as strategists to, to understand as our role to understand a, masses of people and try to figure out, you know, how to empathize with that many people and what they might feel and think about, which you've mentioned a little bit. So I thought I'd ask, was there a particularly, I guess, empathetic or emotional moment during your travels uh, while writing the book that you could share with us? That I can share with you. I think there, it was pretty in, interesting to me that every single person that I stayed with um, shared a secret with me of some sort. This, you know, they were willing to open up and tell me stuff about their lives that they asked me not to share. Mm. Um, and so I think that kind of connection that that we're not just business people, we're not just stuffed suits yeah. Um, making money for companies. We are real people <laughs> that have complex lives and backstories and things. So, um, I think that was particularly emotional and touching because mm. that happened every single time. That happened every single time. And yeah. do you think that's also a function of, of being like inside their lives for much longer than just an hour or two, as well as their homes and commuting with them? I think it's that, but I think it's also kind of like what you're doing right now. Like, just the privilege of having somebody pay attention to you for a, a significant period of time. We don't always have that. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was pen with notebook ready to listen and I wanted to know. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we don't have that experience very often where somebody is genuinely interested in your life. Yeah. So I think that that's also um, very powerful. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it's something that I, I feel privileged every time somebody's taking time out like you are right yeah. now to listen to, to talk about who you are and share exactly. that experience with you, with, well, yeah. with me and with everybody else who's going to be listening to this, really. Um, another one of your mentors, Phil Adams, who uh, is based in Edinburgh, um, uh, recently wrote a blog post and he was talking about an experience he had when you, you talked at a, um, a professional industry talk. Event. Yes, yeah. industry event. That's the word. <laughs> Thank you. You talked at an industry event, but he mentioned you as a female role model. And, uh, and I think that's, that's also something important to talk about because there's less women represented in, in the work of advertising, well, in particular strategy, but a lot of other businesses as well. Yeah. And, uh, and it's an important topic for you, isn't it? Or it is an important topic for me, but I, I know I don't want it to be the only topic that I'm, that I'm interested in, but for sure, I think that, you know, it's, it's been documented that there are fewer women in the higher levels of business mm -hmm. and there has to be a reason. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, like lean in and Sheryl Sandberg and a lot of other, you know, s sociologists have investigated in a much deeper way than I ever will or will be able to mm -hmm. the reasons why, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it, it, there is a discomfort that I've, I've talked about this with my husband. I've like said, well, what if, what if he goes into the advertising business and I just coach him from inside his ear? <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think he would do really well. You mm. know, I think being a man is an advantage, mm. but I think being tall is an advantage. So I think I had, you know, I think being thin is an advantage. So it, it's hard to say, um, which advantage gives you absolute uh absolutely more mm. you know so um like phil is a very quiet humble person mm -hmm. but he's a man so mm. i think that his quiet humble nature maybe kept him from um you know being the ceo of apple which he very well could have been he's so smart mm. but you know it's hard to say which thing hurts you or helps you the most yeah. uh, which is so, so going on a tangent a bit yeah 
what so without staying on it because I, I don't think it's a I think it's an important thing not to step over uh, but at the yeah. same time it's not necessarily the, the the be all and end all but that said I think what kind of advice because that's something that he mentions as well is like new women or younger women looking for a real male uh, role models in in their profession so do you, would you have any advice to younger women getting into either advertising or other types of businesses I think we still have to realize that we're not equal Mm. And you have to be, I mean, this is a business, like we were talking about that, um, thank you advertising post. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he was talking about is like, you have to be relentless in this business. It's very frustrating <laughs> because, yeah. you know, one minute you have a great idea and the next minute the CEO leaves and it never sees the light of day. Yeah. Um, and I think there's just that extra layer of frustration that you experience in an already frustrating business because you are female. So whether that's, I've been to an interview before where I was introduced to the CEO of a big multinational agency and mm -hmm. he looked me up and down. I felt like I needed a shower afterwards. <laughs> oh, wow. um, I've heard of people being, you know, come on to like sexual harassment and stuff like that. Like things that are said, you know, I am not, you've seen my stand up comedy. I am not politically correct. Like yeah. you can make a joke around me for sure. But there is a difference between making a joke and believing something to be true, to believing that one gender is less capable than another. Yeah. And, you know, so there's just that added layer of bullshit that if you are a woman in this business, you have to put up with. And may maybe that won't be that way in hopefully our, our lifetime, but mm. it is that way now. Mm. Is there anything else you want to say about the the brainsurfing book and who you re who you'd recommend it for? Um, sure, I would recommend it for anybody who is in business because I don't think it's just about the advertising business. Um, I think that in the same vein of Dan Pink, he wrote a book called "To Sell Is Human." Mm -hmm. That you know you have to sell your ideas no matter what you're doing. You're not even if you're not a salesperson per se. You have to sell, and so I think that that is a this book is a build on that. That no matter what you're doing, if you are doing something commercially, um, there will be something in this book for you. Because I think it's like I said, it's the act of making this book was like um, sewing a quilt. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different aspects to it. It's not. Heather Lefevre's philosophy of marketing and here's the 10 points that prove it. Mm. It is, this is what's going on today. Um, to the best of my ability, uh, crammed into one thing. This is a lot of different people's thinking. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's what's most different about it is that it turns the, the sort of business book convention on its head. And like you said, I, that was absolutely my goal was to make it an enjoyable read. Yeah. So it's kind of like, The, the travel aspects and the fact that there's dialogue as opposed to just exposition. Mm. Um, it, it should be a, it's a pleasurable read and it's not, it's 75,000 words. So if you're a, a decent paced reader, it should take like six to eight hours to read. <laughs> so mm. I think, I think it's got, there's something in there and it's worth your time. Great. So now that you've published your first book, is there, do you have another project in mind? Is there anything else coming up or in the line or anything you want to talk about along those lines? I would, I think I would like a job again. Yeah. Um, I miss working on a team. Like I said, I don't love that. Was, that was probably the hardest part for me about writing a book is that it's while it's sink or swim and it's all on you, mm. it's very lonely. Yeah. And I had, I certainly had a team of people that helped me get to the finish line. And one person in particular, the editor that I hired, Marissa Van Uden, mm -hmm. was fantastic. But she lived in Berlin for part of the time and then LA for the other part of the time. And I've never met her in person. So it's just, I miss being in person on a team. And that's that's what I'm looking for next. Um, I see the book as a lighthouse sort of expressing who I am, what I'm about, how I work. And hopefully it will speak to somebody that, um, that I can create something with. So I feel like I am a maker. Yeah. I like to create things and, um, it's really difficult, I think, to find the perfect place because especially with the ad agency business, um, most people, their, their jobs last a, on average three years. Mm. And I, I've, tr I've moved around a little bit faster than that because great opportunities kept coming up 
um, and people sought me out. Mm. But I would like to stay in a place and see something through. Like I, I feel like the book shows that I can be committed to something for a significant period of time um, and make it happen if if it's all up to me. But you can see from at least my career, I don't know about yours, that that's not usually the context. Um, like when I took the job here and moved to Miami from Amsterdam, two weeks later, one of my three clients was fired. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that just changes everything. Yes. And you can't, you can't predict those things. But maybe, maybe if I were to try the client side or a consultancy, I have no idea if the, the, the sort of tumultuous aspect of always sort of having to be on the move if you want your next gig, if that would sort of decrease a little bit. That's what I would like. Mm. I would like a little bit more stability. Yeah, stability. I think so. Yeah. I've moved all over the place, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm totally willing to move. I don't think the next thing is going to be in Miami at all. Right. Uh, but I probably will stay in the U.S. I'm open to going back to Europe, but you know, it's, it's kind of just like playing the field, seeing what's around, and hopefully the book will help me find it. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best of luck for that. Definitely Thank that you, you felt get onto the right thing. We'll yeah. finish with a couple of um, cool down questions. We usually okay. finish with that. Uh, so it's the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. So it's customary to ask if you like ice cream. I do like ice cream. Do you have a favorite flavor? I have two. Ooh. So I like mint chocolate chip, but it okay. has to be not, it has to be creamy and not like that spearmint spicy. Okay. And then I also like... Um, is that a particular brand or... They're usually, you know, like haagen is too spicy. Okay. But um, other brands are usually more of the creamy mint flavor. And then um, have you ever been to a Cold Stone Creamery when you were in the U.S.? Uh, not when I was in the U.S., but I had yeah. one down my street in Singapore. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize they had it in Singapore. Yeah, the Singaporeans love food, right? Yes. <laughs> they have every kind. Did you ever have sweet cream flavor there? Yes, sweet cream was I the re- main flavor. Yeah, I thought I was I being love- robbed of vanilla, though. Oh, I really love how it tastes. I like yeah. it better than vanilla. That mixed in with strawberries, that would be also a top one. But it's not It's not everywhere, so you, yeah, and it's it's to, fun the way that they they kind of juggle around with the ice cream while they while they're yeah. preparing it, which is fun. They dramatize the the presentation and mash it all up together on yeah. Yeah, cool. What's Another, your favorite? Yeah, sure. Mine. What's, yeah. Mine is uh, usually well, I have a few, but mine is uh, generally cookie dough, vanilla and cookie dough. Okay. Uh, I recently got into peanut butter with peanut butter cups, which is quite good. Oh, oh, I also like cinnamon flavored ice cream. Have you had that? I don't think I've ever had that. It's really good. Uh, one of the most like strikeout special flavors I've had was when my my elder brother is a chef. Actually, both my brothers are chefs. Oh. And his pastry chef, who now works in Abu Dhabi, is amazing. And his ice creams and desserts were out of this world. One and usually yeah. he he made different kinds of sorbets and tested new stuff. So one was a verbena sorbet, which was just Ooh. amazing. There was a palate cleanser to finish the meal. Yeah, that sounds interesting. It was very very cool. Really really good. Um, another area I look at, which is a personal interest of mine, is uh, gaming and tabletop gaming, board games, card games, role playing games. Is that do, 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 are you into any kind of games, or is that something you've ever been into? I am in. I'm getting into video games. So I went and did a, a month of yoga training this year, and uh-huh. I wanted my husband to go with me. And so, in exchange, I had to learn how to play a video game. Really? So I. I learned and beat Witcher 3, and then now I'm on to Fallout 4. Oh, cool. I've heard a lot of good things about those, but I've kind yeah. of stopped playing video games. I, I kind of just follow the trailers of what's going on, and uh, mm-hmm. and I have a couple of friends who are really into it that tell me about what's happening with the video games. They're always very yeah. impressive. I remember Fallout. I played the first one a long time ago. And then, have you seen the TV show Community? Yes, love it. So there's two episodes of that show where they use the construct of a live action role playing game um, to tell the story of that episode. Yeah. So that made me interested in it. But I I even went to a role playing game shop that's here in Miami because I gave a talk in Brazil earlier this year and I uh-huh. wanted to use that, you know, like how I can't remember the name of that character. Oh, Abed. Yeah. He goes, you know, he's the game master. Yeah. And so he sets the stage and it's like, listen close that you might hearken the yeah. tale. Of, da, da, da. 
And so I wanted to try to use something like that to talk about how much advertising has changed during my career. Brilliant. So I went, I went over to that store and there aren't many 38 year old white women role playing, doing no, role playing. Actually, games. there's a, this is a topic. So I, I participated in another uh, audio podcast in French with friends in Paris. And okay. we are at the moment running a survey uh, to prepare for an episode about women and role playing games. Okay. I know somebody you could, you should talk to. Yeah. We had, we had this, uh, intern at Crispin called Raquel mm -hmm. and she did her graduate studies actually in the Netherlands and her research paper was on live action role playing. So people who, and maybe it's something else. There's another name for it when they dress up and play the game in character. Yeah. It's live action role play. Okay. Okay. So she studied that culture. Cool. as part of her sociology or anthropology degree. Yeah, definitely. I would be very interested in talking to her. Sure. Um, yeah. And, uh, well, actually, and you talking about the, the discourse, I was talking at a conference in Prague last week, and yeah. my talk was all about role-playing games and board games and strategy games, and uh, and I actually did that. What you referred to Abed as, like, describing the scene, I, I yeah. did that in my talk, and I've oh, recorded cool. it. It's going to come out in my podcast. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. Listen to it. Yeah. So... I would do it more and would, so invite me. I would mm -hmm. love to participate. I also play Settlers of Catan. Ah, really? Second. Very, very good game. Yeah, that's a good game. That's about it. And scuba diving, last one. You, you've scuba dived as well. I think it's something we've mentioned to each other in the past, right? That is true. So a favorite spot you've ever dived in? Uh, we went, there's a, there's a wreck off of Key West here. It's called the Vandenberg. And it is about 110 feet, 120 feet down. So I'm not advanced. I'm not supposed to go that deep. But uh -huh. if you hire a dive master, they will take you. <laughs> <laughs> so I like wrecks. I think that those are really interesting. And it's my favorite uh, kind of dive as well. Yeah, yeah. So that I would say is my favorite. Is it a cargo ship or what kind of ship is it? It wasn't cargo. Um, I'm not sure what kind of ship it is, but I think. Do you remember how long the Vandenberg was? Uh, it was 580 feet long. So, do you know what kind of ship it was? Sorry, I'm asking my husband. I think it was some kind of naval defense ship. Oh, he thinks it was some kind of naval defense ship. Did you go inside? We did one swim through, and then we swam the length of it. And there's um, there's lots of interesting like nooks and things. I don't like to get too deep inside of like a cave or a ship. If sure. as long as I can I mean, see. Yeah, as long as I can see the, uh, the where I'm going towards, see the light, you know, I'm okay with it. But yeah. I'm not going to, like, go poking around inside of a boat. Brilliant. Cool. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much yeah. for your time, Heather. Uh, nice to talk to you. Last words, and where can we find you online? That's uh, I'll put all the links in the show notes. But uh, yes. anything in particular, I mean, obviously there's the book. Uh, that's uh, available on Amazon, right? It is. It's available on Amazon. And everything is at my website, heatherlefevre.com. And mm -hmm. I have a weird last name, L-E-F-E-V-R-E. -E. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Talk soon. Yes. Okay. Take care. Bye. Well, that was our show. If you enjoyed it, don't forget you can subscribe to the podcast via iTunes or Stitcher. If you listen through one of those platforms, it'd be awesome if you can take a few minutes to post a review, give it a thumbs up, or even better, share it with a friend if you enjoy it. That'd be awesome. A word of mouth is still the best. You can find more ice cream for everyone goodies to read or listen to on the main website. There's my blog. There's, of course, the podcast that you're listening to now. There's the Ice Cream Sunday newsletter where I write a new story every week to come out every Sunday. The main website is icecreamforeveryone.net, all the words spelled out, icecreamforeveryone.net. You can get all the updates, of course, on Facebook, on my Facebook page. Uh, you can like my page there. You can follow me on Twitter. My handle is at HippoWill. Uh, nothing to do with ice cream. That's just because I like hippos and my name's Will, so why not? A lot of people ask me that question. Um, please get in touch with you have any, if you have any questions. I'd be glad to answer. And uh, thanks again for listening. Bye-bye.